Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon. If you take out your message notes, we're in a series I started last weekend called Living in the Goodness of God. If you missed that first message, please go listen to it online because it's the foundation of everywhere we're going for the next 10 weeks, that when you don't understand how good God really is, it creates all kinds of problems in your life. We specifically talked about four sources of stress in your life that you don't need when you understand the goodness of God. Now what I wanna do today is we're gonna start verse by verse through the most famous chapter in the entire Bible, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And this is a perfect picture of the goodness of God, and it shows you the antidote to the nine greatest sources of stress in your life. Today we're gonna to look at worry. And specifically, I want you to see why God says you should never have to worry for about anything. And then second, how do you connect with God meeting the needs that are in your life? Now, before we look at that, I wanna just give you three facts about the goodness of God. So why don't you write these down? These are just three fundamental truths you can base your life on. Number one, God is the source of everything I need to live. You don't have to look anywhere else. You don't have to look to Wall Street, you don't have to look to the government, you don't have to look to your spouse or your individual retirement account or your social security or your job. God is the source of everything I need to live. Now, the point I wanna make here is that if you're gonna put your security in something, you need to put it in something that can never be taken from you. Because if you have put your security in something that can be taken from you, you're not secure. You can lose your health. You can lose your job. You can lose your good looks. Some of you already have. <laughs> You, you, can lose, you can lose your family, you can lose your life, you can lose your mind. You can lose all of those things. Don't put your security in anyone or anything. You put your security in something that cannot be taken from you, and that is your relationship to God. Nobody can take that away from you. Now, Psalm 23, verse one, the first verse of this chapter says, the Lord is my shepherd, and then read it with me. I will lack nothing, nothing. That's a place where he says, I will be your security in every area. Now, obviously, the first question is, what's a shepherd? And most of you did not grow up on a sheep farm, but shepherds are the people who care for sheep. Now, you probably don't know a lot about sheep, but sheep are incredibly defenseless animals. Uh, they have a lot of natural predators. They're not fast. They can't run. They don't have claws. They don't have teeth with sharp incisors that can bite. Uh, and on top of that, they're not very smart animals. Uh, they're, they're, they're not very intelligent. They fall off cliffs and they get lost and all kinds of things, but they really need a defender. They need a shepherd. Left on its own, a sheep's probably gonna get eaten. And, and so what does a shepherd do? Well, you might write this down because this is what God wants to do for you. A shepherd feeds, leads, and meets needs. That's what a shepherd does. A shepherd feeds, leads, and meets needs. And, and, and God says, I will be your shepherd throughout. I will feed you, I will lead you, and I will meet your needs. Now your needs are various. Um, sometimes you need protection, sometimes you need comfort, sometimes you need encouragement, sometimes you need a little discipline, sometimes you need direction. We're gonna look at all the different needs that God has promised to meet in your life. By the way, if you're a parent, listen, if you're a parent, you're a shepherd. Dads, it is your job to feed, lead, and meet needs. Mom, it is your job to feed, lead, and meet needs of those children. So you have a shepherd's role. If you are ever in any management position in a business, in your career, 
and you have people under you that you are supervising, that you are caring for, that has shepherding capabilities or responsibilities to it. And as a manager, it's your job to feed, information, motivation, things like that. It's your job to lead, and it is your job to meet needs of the people. Uh, as a leader, you serve them, not they serve you. By the way, do you know what the Greek word for shepherd is? Pastor. I am a shepherd. That is my job. It is my job to feed you through this book. It is my job to lead you. It is my job to meet your needs. That's what shepherds do. So if you have any kind of caring capacity where you are over a small group as a leader, you're a shepherd. Or you, are a, you work in some ministry, you're a shepherd. And so the very things that God does with us, feed, lead, and meet needs, um, God wants you to do with other people. Now, the second truth I want you to write down, first, God is the source of everything I need to live. Number two, there is nothing I need that God can't supply. There is nothing that I need, that you need, that God cannot supply. And we're gonna look at this in depth, but in Philippians chapter four it says this, verse 19. God will supply all you'll ever need from his glorious resources in Christ Jesus. If you take a note, you might circle in Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that. God's goodness is not based on your goodness. It's based on his goodness. You don't have to be good for God to be good to you. God is good to you because of what Jesus did on the cross. And number three, third thing I want you to write down is this. God doesn't want me worrying about anything. <coughs> Nothing, nada, zip, zero. In fact, worry may be the most common sin on the planet. God says, you don't need to worry. I don't want you worrying. In Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. That's pretty clear. Uh, I looked up that word, don't worry about anything, and it actually means anything. <laughs> uh, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. We've talked about this many times. You can pray or you can panic. If you're not praying, you're panicking. You can worry or you can worship. If you're not worshiping, you're worrying. You invite worship in the front door, worry goes out the back door. You invite worry in the front door, worship goes out the back door. And so God says, I don't want you worrying about anything. Now why? Why does God not want me worrying about anything? Well, in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us five reasons why worry is worthless. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly and then we're gonna look at what difference it makes in your life. So write these down. Five reasons God says you should never, never, ever, ever worry about anything. Number one, he says worry is unreasonable. It's unreasonable. In other words, it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. It is irrational. It is unreasonable. And the Bible says this in Matthew chapter six, verse 25. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, and don't worry about your body or what you'll wear. Your life is far more important than clothes. Now, for some of you, that's a big revelation, but that's true, okay? <laughs> clothes don't make the man or the woman. Um, and so he says, don't worry. Don't worry about these minor issues here. And he's saying that worry is unreasonable. Now, why is worry unreasonable? Let me give you three reasons it's unreasonable. Uh, in the first place, we typically worry about the wrong thing. We worry about the little stuff, how I look, how I appear, what I say, who, I, who I'm talking to, stuff, am I gonna be late for this meeting? Stuff that isn't gonna matter in five years. It's all temporary. If you're really gonna worry, and God says you shouldn't, but if you were gonna worry, worry about things that are eternal, not external. Worry about stuff that's gonna matter in 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years or for eternity. Don't worry about stuff that's not gonna to matter tomorrow. And yet most of the things we worry about are temporary things, like in the next five minutes, I'm worried about this. And so he says it's unreasonable because you pick the wrong things to be concerned about. The second reason is to worry about something you can change, uh, or something you can't change is useless. If you can't change it, why are you worrying about it? Uh, to worry about something you can change is stupid. So either way, if you can change it, change it. If you can't change it, 
So what? You, you can't do anything about it. Worry will not change it at all. So he says it's irrational because we think that worry is actually a form of control. We think by, control, by worrying about something, we're actually controlling them. By worrying about your kids who are out late at night, you think you're controlling them. You're not. You're not. It doesn't change anything. And, and every, the third reason why it's irrational, and you've noticed this, is that any time you worry about something, it keeps getting bigger in your mind. It's not logical, it's irrational. And so if you start worrying about somebody criticizes you, says an unkind word to you, says an off the wall comment, it hurts your feelings, and you, you worry about that, you go, what did they mean? They've already forgotten it, and they probably didn't even mean it, it was just some stupid thing they said. But if you keep going over a worry in your mind, it doesn't get smaller. When you worry, it gets bigger. And if you keep thinking about it, pretty soon you think the whole world hates me. No, they don't hate you. No, they don't hate you. That's the irrationality of worry. Worry is unreasonable. Number two, Jesus says you should never worry. Not only because it's unreasonable, it's unnatural. Nature does not worry. It's unnatural. Human beings are the only thing in nature. Human beings are the only thing God has created in all the universe that worry. You know, ants don't worry, cows don't worry, plants don't worry, rocks don't worry, horses don't worry. The only thing that worries are human beings in rebellion against God. It's unnatural. You weren't made to worry. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us a couple of lessons. He uses a biology lesson and a botany lesson, or plants and, and, uh, and, and animals. Look at this, verse 26 in Matthew 6. Jesus says, you know, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. They're not worried about, you know, do I have enough to live on? And he said, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than birds? If God takes care of birds, isn't he gonna take care of you? And then he says in verse 28 and 29, Matthew 6, why do you worry about your clothes? Well, you go out and look at the flowers. Look at the field lilies. They don't worry about, about how they look, yet King Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed as beautifully as they are. I don't know if you've ever looked at a flower real close, uh, an orchid or a rose or any kind of flower, the intricacy and the design and the detail and the beauty of just an ordinary wild, uh, wildflower. God says, look, they're beautiful the way they are. They don't have to put on makeup. They don't have to get fancy. They don't have to worry about how they appear to everybody else. They're not worried about their appearance. They're just who they are, and it's beautiful. Now, what he's doing here is he's giving us a couple of lessons from nature. He says, okay, let's look at bird watching. If anybody's on God's welfare plan, it's birds. Because birds really don't do anything. What do they contribute to the world? All they do is tweet and poop. Okay. And you do both of those. <laughs> but, but you do a lot more than that. Birds, are, well, well, I mean, what? I mean, you, you don't eat birds. They, they don't provide sustenance for, for you know, human beings. And he says they're, they're on God's welfare system. God just made them because they're beautiful. They're sweet to the, listen to. And he says, look, they're not worried. And aren't you more valuable than the birds? I take care of them. I, I'll take care of you. And, and then he gives a botany lesson. He says, look at these flowers and, and how God makes them beautiful just the way they are. You're beautiful just the way you are. So he's saying, animals don't worry, plants don't worry, nothing in all creation worries. The only thing I've created that worries, that trust, that doubts me, that, that doesn't trust me, are human beings. And he said, all of creation trusts my care except humans. He's saying, worry isn't natural. Did you know you weren't born to worry? You weren't made to worry. Now, some of you think, well, I, I was a born worrier. No, you weren't. Worry is learned. You learned it by watching other people worry. No baby worries. They learn to worry watching other people worry. Now, anything that is learned can be, yeah, unlearned. So you don't have to go the rest of your life being a worry wart, being so uptight, having your stomach in a knot, getting a tight and tense back, having to go get a massage, getting a migraine headache, all these other symptoms of worry. God says, you don't need to worry about that. Worry is unreasonable and worry is unnatural. You have to, by the way, not only do you have to learn it, you have to practice it to get good at it, but some of you are pros at worrying. I mean, you're really good, you're good at worrying, but you can unlearn it. And uh, notice 
in verse 26 there, he says, your father sees what the birds, he says, your father takes care. It doesn't say the bird's father, it says your father. So you're in a different category. God created everything else, but he made you his child. God is not the father of cows. God is not the father of ants. God is not the father of, of uh, you know, horses, because they weren't made in God's image. You and I are distinctly different from all the other plants and animals because we were made in God's image, which gives us the capacity to trust him, to love him. You never see a cow praying. You, know? you never see a doggy going to worship, unless you brought him. And uh, he's saying it's not natural. He said, God cares for you as a father. Children get special privileges, even more than the other things in creation. Worry is unreasonable, worry is unnatural. Number three, Jesus says worry is unhelpful. What does he mean by that? It's useless. It doesn't work. Worry is worthless. It doesn't change anything when you worry. Matthew 6, verse 27, Jesus says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Worry can't make you an inch taller. Worry can't make you an inch shorter. Can't make you bigger or smaller, thinner or fatter. Worry doesn't work. He says, who of you can change anything? He says, you can't add even a single hour to your life. In fact, worry can shorten your life. If you're worried, well, I may not live long, and if you start worrying about it, the tension and the stress could actually shorten your life. But worry about any problem in your life will never move you one step toward that situation. Worry is worthless. It's stewing without doing. It's investing a lot of emotional energy for something that doesn't gonna do anything. It's like sitting in a rocker, and you can rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you expend a lot of energy, but you're not one inch further. You have made no progress at all. Worry cannot change anything. In fact, the only thing worry can change is you. It'll make you miserable, uh, and that's what it does. It won't change that person you're worried about. It'll only change you, make you more miserable. Now, follow me on the logic of this. Worry cannot change anything in your past. It's already done. Your past is past, so why are you worried about it? Worry cannot control your future. No matter how much you think you can, you're not controlling it by worrying about it. So if it can't change the past and it can't control the future, what does it do? Messes up today. It just keeps you messed up today. It keeps you stewing without doing, as I, as I said. It just ruins the present. It saps the strength out of your body. It is not only unreasonable and unnatural, it's unhelpful. Proverbs 12, 25, uh, the Bible says, worry weighs us down. Anybody wanna give a testimony about that? Has worry ever weighed you down? Of course it has. And, and you, get so, you think about so many things that you're worried about, you start to get discouraged. You start to get depressed. You start to get in despair. You see, God tells us that your body was not designed for worry. Remember, it's unnatural. You weren't made to worry. And, and every time you swallow your worry, your stomach keeps score. Every time you swallow your worry, you say, oh, my aching back. Oh, I got a headache. Oh, my stomach's upset. Why? Because you weren't made to internalize worry. It's unnatural and it's unhelpful. It's actually unhealthful. And it is bad for your health. People who worry don't live as long as other people. People say, well, I'm worried sick. Yes, you are. You, worry, you can worry yourself sick and cause all kinds of problems in your stomach and insomnia and stuff like that. In fact, I'll tell you this. Worry causes more fatigue than work. Worry causes more fatigue than work. You can go to work, put in a full day's work, come home. You're tired, but you're not stressed out. But if you go to work and all day you're worrying, 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 you come home, you're not just tired, you're drop dead fatigued. Worry wears you out more than work. And yet the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body. You wanna be healthier? I mean, really, you wanna be healthier? Stop worrying. You gotta you got learn to trust God. Worry is unhelpful, it is unnatural, it is unreasonable. Number four, worry is unnecessary. That's the fourth thing Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. He says worry is unnecessary. Why are you worrying about this? 
He says, there's no need to worry because God has promised to take care of you. The Lord is your shepherd. He feeds, he leads, and he meets needs. And he says, there's no need to worry because your heavenly Father will take care of you. You know, when I was a kid, um, if I had any need in my life, I didn't worry about it. I just went to my dad. I said, Dad, I need this, or Mom, I need this. And if I needed money for, to buy something, I'd say, Dad, I need some money to, to buy this. I never once worried about where he was going to get the money. That was his worry. <laughs> You're worrying about a lot of things that are God's responsibility. Worry is assuming responsibility that God never intended for you to have. Every time you worry, it's a warning light. I'm playing God. I'm acting like God. I'm, I'm a, a, a thinking that it all depends on me, that I don't have a heavenly father, that I don't have a, a, a shepherd who will feed and lead and meet my need. So you never worry if you understand that God is your heavenly father and you understand the goodness, the goodness of God. Matthew 6, verse 30 says this. If God cares so wonderfully, even for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, in other words, they're only going to bloom for a few days and then they're gone, but your life lasts decades. If God cares so wonderfully even for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he surely care for you? You see, what he's saying here is that God has assumed responsibility for the needs in your life. And he cares for you because he says you are valuable. You have value. You want to know how much you value? Look at the cross. Jesus died for you on the cross. That shows how much value you have to God. You're not junk. You're not worthless. No, no. You are valuable to God because you're his child. My children are valuable to me. My grandchildren are valuable to me. You are the child of God and you're valuable to God. He says, I'm going to take care of your needs. I'm your loving heavenly father. I am your shepherd. And like the shepherd takes care of the defenseless sheep, when you need it, I'm there. What am I saying? I'm saying that worry in your life, every time you worry, it comes from the fact that you misunderstand the goodness of God. Worry is a warning sign. It's a yellow caution light going, bam, bam, bam. That's saying, at this point, I've forgotten how good God is. I've forgotten the promises of God. I've forgotten what God has promised to do in my life to meet all my needs. He says it over and over and over. I will meet all your needs. There's no need that God will not meet if you trust him. Now, if you don't trust him, you're out there on your own. But if you trust him, he says, I will meet every need in your life. And worry means I've forgotten that, the goodness of God. It comes from misunderstanding what God is really like. And you know what? We always get into trouble every time whenever we start doubting God's goodness. When we start thinking, God's not going to take care of me. God doesn't really love me. God isn't a good God. Every time you start thinking like that, and you know where those thoughts came from, um, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to go down a blind alley, hit a dead end, have all kinds of discouragement in your life. And it doesn't even make sense. Most of you here sitting here this, uh, in this day are, are believers. You've stepped across the line spiritually. You've said, you know, I've put my trust in Jesus Christ because I know heaven's perfect and I'm not. There's no chance I'm getting to heaven on my own goodness because I'm not good enough. So I'm trusting Jesus Christ to forgive me and to save me by his grace. Not by my works, but I'm just trusting God to save me because he's, he loves me, he wants to forgive me, he sent Jesus to die for me. When Jesus died on the cross for you, he solved your biggest problem. You don't have any bigger problem than eternal salvation. But if that's your biggest problem, why do you doubt his taking care of the smaller things in your life? What's the logic of saying, I'm going to trust God to get me to heaven, but I'm not going to trust him to help me make my car payment? What, what's the logic in that? It makes no sense. Why would you trust God with something so big, eternal salvation, but not trust him with, who am I supposed to marry? Or am I ever going to get married? Or am I going to get a job? Or what school should I go to? And all the other major questions in life. Why don't you trust him with those things too? It doesn't make sense to say, oh, I, I don't doubt him for my salvation, but I do doubt that he's going to care for my health. I do doubt that he's going to care for my career. It doesn't make sense at all. If God can be trusted for salvation, he'll carry everything else. 
Remember walking down, you know, a street out here, say Ortega Highway, and you come by in a car, I've got a backpack on my, light, on my back, and you, you stop and say, hey, Rick, you want to ride? I say, yeah, I'd appreciate that. So, so I get in, uh, get in the car with you, and about five minutes later, you look over and you see I'm still wearing the backpack on my back. And you say, Rick, you can just toss that in the back seat. And I say, oh, no, it's enough for you to carry me. I'll carry the backpack. That's the kind of stupid logic we do with our lives. <laughs> oh yeah, God, you can save my life, but I'll worry about my money and my sex life and my social life and my career life and uh, you know, all the other things, my friendships, my relationships. No, no, you're, you don't need to carry the backpack either. If he's gonna carry you to heaven, he'll carry everything else while you're here on earth. He's saying worry is unnecessary and then number five worry is not only unreasonable it's unnatural it's unhelpful it's unnecessary it's unbelief number five worry Jesus says is unbelief worry is doubting God God has promised to take care of every need in your life if you trust him over and over and over and when you doubt that you are an unbeliever at that moment you're an unbeliever. Every time you worry, you act like an unbeliever. Look at this verse on the screen. Philippians 4.19. Love this in the message in the Living Bible. You can be sure, that means certain, it's not a wish, not a hope. You can be sure that God will take care of most things you need. No, I didn't say that. God will take care of everything, everything. What's not included in everything? Nothing. Everything you need because of what Jesus has done for us. Again, God is good to you, not because you're good. God is good to everybody. He's good to even bad people in the world. They get the same life. They get oxygen. They get blood. They get food. They get the sunshine. God is good based on his goodness, not based on your goodness. Now he's saying here, um, if God's going to take care of every need, you, every time you worry, you are doubting God. Have you ever thought about that? That's why worry is a sin. It's, it's doubting God. Look at this verse, Matthew 6, 32. People who don't know God, people who don't know God and the way he works, they worry over these things. Now let me be honest with you. If you haven't stepped across the line, if you're not a believer in Christ, if you haven't made Jesus the good shepherd or the, the Lord is my shepherd of your life, you ought to worry. You ought to worry because you're up a creek without a paddle. You're out there on your own. You're not depending on your heavenly father. You're not depending on God's goodness and grace and love. You're depending on yourself. You ought to worry. There's a lot of reasons to worry if you don't have God in your life because you've got to face all those battles on your own. You've got to find all the solutions on your own, and you're not God, and neither am I. We're just not. And so it's the starting point is the humble attitude, God is God and I'm not. And when I understand that, all of a sudden the worry starts draining out of my life. People who don't know God and the way he works, they worry about these things. Non-believers ought to worry, but Christians are different because we have a heavenly Father, a good God who promises to care for us, and God says, hey, you guys, what are you worrying about? You're not plants. You're not, you're not animals. You're not birds. You're my children. You see, it's actually an insult to God every time you worry. You're acting like an orphan every time you worry. You're acting like you don't have a heavenly father who has promised over and over again over 3,000 promises in this book to take care of your needs. You're acting like you're an orphan. You know, there's a beautiful phrase we just read. He said, your father knows you need them. He knows what you need. How many times do you act like God doesn't know what you need? God, do you know about my sexual needs? Do you know about my physical needs? Do you know about my social needs? I don't think God knows about my career needs. Really? That's doubting God. Worry is unbelief. You don't think God sees it all. What I'm telling you is this. When you worry, every time you worry, you're acting like an atheist. You're acting like there is no God. There is no promises in the scripture. You know, I'm just out here on my own. Worry is practical, 
atheism. And saying, I don't really believe God will help me out of this mess. And we start depending on ourselves and we start taking matters into our own hands and we assume that we have to figure it all out rather than just trusting. That's called playing God. And you know what? That's a poor testimony. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you're worried all the time, that's a lousy witness to the world. It's saying, uh, you know, I'm just like you. I don't, I don't have a God who, who takes care of my needs. I'm, I'm playing God. And by the way, you know what the worst kind of worry is? When you say, you know, things are going too good. Well, things, I, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop because things are going too, that's the worst kind of worry you could possibly have. I don't really believe God is a good God because things are going too good. So something is bound to happen. That's what Job's, there's a whole book of the Bible about that kind of worry, it's called the book of Job. Job was enormously successful. He was wealthy, he was well known, he was beloved, he was popular, he was famous, he, he'd be a billionaire today, and he kept going, mm, things are going too good. And, and when everything fell apart, he goes, that which I have feared has happened. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. When we get to heaven, you're gonna see how many times you set yourself up for failure by worrying. Instead of trusting. Instead of trusting. You think God's ever worried? No. When God made you in his image, he doesn't want you to worry. John chapter 14, verse one, Jesus says this. Don't be worried. What do I do instead of worrying? He says, believe in God and believe in me. Now how do you do that? How do you trust God to meet your needs? Well, it's not rocket science, friends. It's just three or four things, and God makes it very clear in the Bible that if you'll do these four things, worry is gonna drain out of your life. I don't want you worrying anymore. Every time you worry is a wasted second of your life. It's wasted energy. As I said, it doesn't change anything. It's unreasonable, it's unhelpful, it's unnatural. It's, it's unbelief. It's unhealthy. So how do I trust God for my needs instead of worrying about my needs? Well, the Bible says you do four things. Write these down. Number one, and you do this every day. It's not a one-time thing. Every day, ask him to be my shepherd. Every day, I ask Jesus to be my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And if I ask him to be my shepherd, then he's gonna feed and he's gonna lead and he's gonna meet my need in that day. By the way, he'll not only feed, lead, and meet your need, he can also forgive your misdeed and help you succeed. <laughs> if you just trust him. So, what do you do? You do this every morning. When you get up, you sit on the side of your bed and you say, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus Christ, I'm expecting you to feed me, to lead me, and to meet my needs today, to help me succeed, forgive my misdeeds. I, I will trust you today. And I start every day by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, you're a good God. And then I say it throughout the day. Every time you go into a meeting, the Lord is my shepherd, he's gonna help me in this meeting. You got a parent-teacher conference, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> What I'm about to hear, I may not want to hear, but he's going to feed me, lead me, and meet my needs. Uh, any, you got a major decision to make. The Lord is my shepherd. You might say it 10 or 15 times a day. But if you'll start saying that phrase, your worry will go down. Every time you start to worry, you need to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm asking Jesus Christ to feed me, to lead me, to meet my needs. And I'm not gonna worry about it because it says, I've promised I will take care of your needs if you will trust me. Now in John chapter 10, Jesus says this, verse 14, 15. I am the good shepherd. When you say the Lord's my shepherd, who is that? Jesus says, I'm it, I'm him. I am the Lord, I am the good shepherd. And I know my own sheep, and they know me, and I lay down my life for my sheep. That's what he did on the cross. He gave his life for you. And if he loved you enough to die for you, he certainly loves you enough to feed, lead, and meet your need. Every day you need to pray the prayer that David prayed. It's this next verse, Psalm 28, verse nine. Come, Lord, save us 
and bless us. Be our shepherd and always carry us in your arms. He said, you can pray these things. The Lord's my shepherd, so I need to say, Lord, I need you to save me today. I need you to bless me today. Uh, I, I need you to, to uh, be my shepherd today. I need to carry you to carry me in your arms. Do you remember when you were a little kid, your parents would go on an outing, you'd go on a picnic or a hike or you know, you go hunting or fishing or you go to Disneyland, and at the end of the day, your little legs are so tired, mom or dad has to carry you out to the car because you're just pooped out. Your legs give out as a little kid. And that's what happens during the week sometimes. And you say, God, I am just pooped out. I am worn out. I, I, I don't think I can put one foot in front of the other. I need you to carry me right now. Carry me to the car. Take me home. Get me home. And he says, I'm your shepherd. I'll care for you. I'll bless you. I'll protect you. I'll save you. I'll guide you. I'll direct you. I'll discipline you when you need it. I'll, uh, I'll defend you. I, I will do all of these things. And when you're worn out and you're tired and you can't put one foot in front of the other, I'll carry you. Just hop on and I'll, 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 take, you, I'll take you to the car. I'll take you home. That's what you do. Every day ask him to be my shepherd. Number two. Second, this is very important, I give him, Jesus, first place in every area of my life. This is extremely important. That I give Jesus first place in every area of my life. Now, if you're a believer, you've given him first place in your life. I so said, I want you to be number one. But there's different parts of your life that are not under his control. And when you say, Jesus, come into my house, you need to say, have the whole house. You got access to the bedroom. You got access to the bathroom. You got access to the kitchen in my life. You got access to that closet over there where I got all kinds of stuff hidden. You got access to the garage, to the living room, to the dining room. It's all yours. Jesus, take over the whole house. Have you ever said that? Not, yeah, God, I want you to just get me to heaven. I want you to be number one every area of my life. Now, the Bible says this, Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. Your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need. Now, let me stop right there. Your heavenly Father perfectly knows already what you need. So any need you mention to God, he already knows. Someday I'm going to do a message called Phrases You'll Never Hear God Say. Like, oops. <laughs> you know, you never want to hear a surgeon say that when you're laying on a table. Oops. God never says oops. God never says, well, I didn't know that. Well, slap me. You know, I, I didn't see that one coming. I didn't see that one coming. God will never say that. God knows your needs better than you do. You got needs, you don't even know you've got needs. God says, man, that's a big need. That's a big need in their life. They don't even see it, they're blind to it. They got a blind spot. They have no idea how many needs they've got. God knows your needs better than you do. So anytime you come to God with needs, he's not gonna go, whoa, I never saw that one coming. He knew it before he made you. God, listen, allows needs in your life so you'll come to him so he can answer that need, so you'll trust him. We looked at that circle last week. You get a need, and, and, and then you, you ask God to meet that need, you cry out, God meets that need, and then you trust God more, and you do that circle thousands of times. That's how you learn to trust God. If you didn't have needs, you'd never trust God. So God allows needs in your life, so you can learn to trust him. But he says, I already know what you need uh, before you even ask. And he says, and he will, not might, he will give you what you need if, here's the condition, if you give him first place in your life and you live as he wants you to. So you give God first place in every area of your life. Now let me just tell you something. Anytime you worry, that is a warning light that that particular area of your life, you have not given him first place. Every time you worry, you go, oh, that's an area where God's not number one. Any area of your life where God is not number one, you're going to worry about it. Any area of your life where God's not number one, that's going to be a source of insecurity in your life, your job or anything else. Any area in your life that is not under the lordship of Christ, is not given first place to God, that's gonna be a constant source of worry and insecurity your entire life. 
So if nothing's first, God is first place in no area of your life, you got everything to be worried about. But you might hold on to a couple areas. God, you can have the whole house, but don't have the bedroom. Then you're going to worry about that area. God, you can have every area of the house except the kitchen. Then you're going to worry about that area. It's the sign that he's not number one. It's an indication that you've got mixed up values. When you make Jesus Christ number one in every single area of your life, it really simplifies your priorities, and it also gives you a whole lot less to worry about. See, when it's given to God, then you don't have to worry about it. Too often we worry about things. We worry about physical possessions. And, and it's just like that. If you have fewer possessions, you have less. To, you know, I never, 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 never worry about getting barnacles on my yacht. Because I don't have a yacht. So I've never, never worried about how am I going to get those barnacles off that yacht? I don't have to worry about it because my life is, is simplified and, and the things that are in my life, they, I've given them to God. Now, as long as you love anything else in your life more than God, that area is going to become a source of worry to you. Just count on it. It's going to become a source of stress and a source of insecurity if God, if you love it more than God. You're going to be victimized by worry and anxiety. And eventually, everybody has to decide, you and me and everybody else, what am I going to live for and who am I going to live for? Um, and whatever that answer is becomes your Lord. For some of you, your job is your Lord. For some of you, your marriage is your Lord. For some of you, your children is your Lord. Those are all good things. Nothing wrong with them. They just don't deserve God's place. And when anything takes place of God, that's called an idol, and it creates stress, and it creates worry, and it creates insecurity. You know, one of the things we worry about the most, of course, is money. And what I've discovered is that no matter how much or how little you've got of, about it, you still worry about it. You know, I've been in 164 countries, and I've seen the poorest of the poor of the poor of the poorest of the poor. And on the other hand, I know a number of billionaires and multi-multi-billionaires. You know what I've discovered at both ends? They both worry about money. And if you don't have it, you worry about getting it. If you've got it, you're worrying about keeping it, saving it, spending it, investing it, protecting it. And God says, I don't want you worrying about that. I'll take care of all your needs. So every day I ask Jesus to be my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it 50 times a day. And then I give him first place in every area of my life. Here's the third thing. This is the third thing God wants to say to you, and we're going to cover this more in detail next week. Relax. Relax and give him my worries in prayer. God wants you to relax. He wants you to give him your worries in prayer. And you say, Jesus, just take these things I'm worried about, and you just hand them over to him. You know, last week we talked about uh, counting your blessings. I said, you know, look at all the things God has done for you in your life that, that, that are good. I said, make a list. Make a list of all the good things God's done for you, and when you start getting down, pull out that list and read, wow, God really has been good to me. The freedom I have. I have a brain. I can see. I can hear. Uh, all, all of the many things that you take for granted. So you make a list of blessings, but sometimes, you know what you need to do? You need to make a list of worries. And you say, you know, sometimes you have this sense of, I just feel anxious. I, I have this general anxiety. I, I feel a little uptight, a little nervous, and I don't really know what's causing it. Well, you can just say, God, I, I give you my generalized worry, but it's even better to stop and go, what is it that's really bugging me? Am I worried that somebody's going to disapprove of me? Then you write that down. Am I worried that I'm going to be rejected? And you write that down. Am I worried that I'm going to be insecure and not have enough? You write that down. Am I worried that I'm going to be lonely the rest of my life? You write that down. You write them all down, and then you give God your worries. You say, here's the list, Lord. Here's some stuff that's on my mind today. I'm not going to keep them. I I'm going to give them to you. Notice this next verse, 1 Peter 5, 7. Give all your worries and cares to God. In other words, don't stuff them. For he cares about what happens 
to you. He says, give them to God. You weren't made, remember, you're, it's unnatural to worry, so you shouldn't swallow your worries. When you swallow your worries, your stomach keeps score, as I just said. And, and so you need, when you are worried, it doesn't work to try to deny it or ignore it, like push it down. Oh, I'm not worried, I'm not worried, I'm not worried, I'm not worried. That doesn't work. Because in your mind, uh, it's going, yeah, you're worried, yeah, you're worried, yeah, you're worried, yeah, you're worried. And you keep pushing it out of the way, and it's, it's like pu putting it under the carpet, and then the carpet pile gets bigger and bigger, and you start stumbling over it. No, when you are worried, don't repress it, push it down. Don't suppress it, deny it, I'm, I'm not worried. Yeah, you are. Don't repress it, don't suppress it, express it to God. Confess it to God. And say, God, here's my list of worries. If you try to push down the worries in your life, you're gonna get sick. It's like taking a can of Coke, shaking it all up real violently, and then putting it in the freezer. What's gonna happen to that can of Coke? It's gonna explode. It's gonna expand, it's gonna explode, and it's gonna come out sideways. And it'll come out sideways in your life, in a broken relationship, an explosion at work, and all these other areas, when, you, when we take so much worry onto ourselves, and then eventually it, it comes out. So you relax and you give him your worries. And you just say, God, here, here are the things I'm worried about. Now you remember earlier, we read that verse where Jesus said, you know, don't worry about anything. I'm, I'm going to meet your needs. Well, right before that, he had said this. Look up on the screen. Matthew 6, 32. He says, for the people who don't know God... The unbeliever, the people who don't know God, they run after all these things. He said, you know, do I look good? Do I feel good? Do I have the goods? I'm living the good life. Uh, do I have the clothes? Do I have the food? Do I have the appearance? Do I have the car? Do I have the right jewelry? Do I have the accessorizing myself? And all these different things. So the people who don't know God run after all these things. Now, I don't have to go into this because you know what people are running after in California. Material goods keeping up with the Joneses, all those things. They run after all these things. You know, it's interesting. I, I looked up this word, run. It says these people who don't know God run after these things. It actually means in Greek, frantically seeking. Frantically seeking materialism. You know, uh, passions, pleasures, possessions. Things. Frantically seeking. It's scurrying to get about. When I think of this verse, they run after these things. I think of... Uh, shopping crowds at the mall on Black Friday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> They're running after these things. I'm afraid I'm not going to get the deal. And there's a limited number of items on sale, so i got to get there and i got to elbow you and push you. He says, unbelievers, people who don't know God, they're like this. They're frantic. Get, 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 grabbing. He said they run after all these things. They're hurrying and scurrying all the time. I want you to write this down. Hurry creates worry. Hurry creates worry. And the faster you go in life, the more likely you are to worry. You need to slow down. You need to relax. You need to take a little bit slower pace. Hurry creates worry. Hurrying and If you're hurrying and scurrying, you're going to end up worrying. Now, the Bible says this. We looked at the verse earlier, but I'm going to go back to it on the screen. Philippians 4 verses six and seven. It says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't panic, pray. Tell God about all your needs, say, that's, give it to God, and thank him for all he's done for you. If you do this, if you do this, you'll experience God's peace. God's peace, not your own peace, God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. The Bible calls this the peace that passes understanding. What is the peace that passes understanding? It's when you're at peace and you have no logical, rational reason to be at peace. I just lost my job. Somehow I'm, I'm, I'm at peace about it. Why? The Lord is my shepherd. You just got the, the dreaded word and report from the doctor. It's cancer. But for some reason I got peace about it. Why? Peace that passes understanding because the Lord is my shepherd. I just found out some bad news that a dear friend of mine just died. Somehow, I'm, I'm at peace about it in my heart. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. 
He feeds and he leads and he meets my needs. That's the peace that understand it. And that's a witness to the world. People go, man, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that woman. She's at peace in the middle of chaos. Anybody can be at peace when you're out fishing. You know, but, but if, if, if you're at peace in the middle of chaos, that's the peace that passes understanding. He says, don't worry about it. God's peace will, will give you what you need. So every day, I start the day, and throughout the day, I say, the Lord is my shepherd. I ask him to be my shepherd. Then I give him first place in every area of my life, not just this area, but every single compartment of my life. And then I relax. And every time a worry comes up, I say, the Lord's my shepherd. And I give that worry to God. I don't hold on to it. I don't think I gotta think about it later. I say, God, take that one. I, I don't have time to think about that worry. Take that worry, God. Take that worry, God. And you just keep loading them on. He can handle it. He can handle it. Now the fourth thing is this, very important. Trust him, trust God, trust Jesus for one day at a time. Trust him for one day at a time. Don't try to steal the whole future into the day and bring it back here, have worries about all this kind of stuff that's coming up. Trust him for one day at a time. Matthew chapter six, verse 34, Jesus says this. So don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have its own worries. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Anybody agree with that verse? Yeah, you don't need to borrow trouble. He's saying, don't borrow trouble for tomorrow. I'm gonna give you enough grace for today. I'm not gonna give you the grace for tomorrow until you get to tomorrow. You don't need it today. He's saying, don't open your umbrella until it starts to rain, okay? Don't start, that stuff hadn't happened yet. Can't change the future, can't change the past, just work on today. There are two days of every week you should never worry about. Yesterday and tomorrow. Because you can't do anything about them. And, and you, you don't worry about the future until you've successfully learned to manage today. Some of you aren't doing that good a job on that one. So why are you borrowing trouble and worrying about something that's happening in two weeks? You see, when you think about it, today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. And, and, and so yesterday, you messed up yesterday because you worried about today. Now today, you're messing up today because you're worrying about tomorrow. So don't do that. Take one life, take one day at a time through your life. Now why? Why does God say that you should only live your life one day at a time? Well, because it's true. It's the only thing you can do. You can't live in the past. You can't live in the future. You can only live today, but there's a couple reasons why you should only live one day at a time. First, when you worry about tomorrow's problems, you miss all the blessings of today. Some of you, you got something coming up in two weeks or a week or a month, and it's scaring you to death, and you're making it worse because you're ruining every day between now and then by worrying about it. What is that worrying doing? It's unhelpful, it's unuseful, all of those different things. And, and, and so you're missing today's blessing. Some of you are so worried about retirement, you're not enjoying today. You're missing the blessing of today. And he says, I don't want you doing that. Think it, take it one day at a time. And the other reason is, you cannot solve tomorrow's problems with today's power. When you get there tomorrow, God will give you the power and the perspective and the grace and the wisdom, he'll give you what you need when you need to get there. But he's not gonna give you the power and promise and purpose and all those things for tomorrow, today. So you're, you're taking on a problem, God says, I'm not giving you power for that, because I want you to trust me one day at a time. The Bible does not say, give us this day our weekly bread. <laughs> no, you're to pray, give me today my daily bread. Give me just enough strength to make it through today. He wants you to depend on him one day at a time. Now, let me be clear, as your pastor, because I love you, it's okay to plan for tomorrow. It's okay to plan for the future. Just don't worry about the future. Planning is good, worrying is bad. Jesus highly recommends planning. There's a whole book in the Bible about planning. It's called the book of Proverbs. God says it's foolish not to plan. Like, only a fool would go all the way through life unprepared for something you know is inevitable called death. Are you kidding me? 
You haven't made your peace with God. You know you're gonna die. You don't know when it's gonna happen. To go through life unplanned for death, you're not ready to live till you're ready to die. So you ought to plan. Planning is good. Worrying is bad. You can plan for tomorrow, but you can't live in tomorrow. You can only live today. Now, I know that the future can often seem, you know, very overwhelming. Uh, But God graciously divided it up into 24-hour segments. So you don't get all the future at once. You get it 24 hours at a time. And if God gave you all the future at one time, it would overwhelm you. But you're not there yet. You're not ready for it. And so God gives it to you in 24-hour increments. Think of your life like an hourglass. Remember where the sand goes through the hourglass? The sand, there's all this sand up here, but it goes through one grain at a time. You can handle that. You can handle one grain at a time. You can't handle all the sand at once. So it's not going to come at you all at once. You're going to hit the future one day at a time. You can handle that. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. Now, Psalm Matthew 6, verse 34 says this. Look up here on the screen. I love this in the message uh, translation. It says this. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. When the time comes. Now, having said all this, is it possible that worry may be one of your most chronic sins? It's unhelpful, it's unreasonable, it's unbiblical, it it, it, it doesn't work, it's irrational. It's unbelief. And maybe you just need to say, God, I'm sorry. I haven't been saying the Lord is my shepherd. I have been saying I'm worried. I'm I'm worried. Now, let me just add here. If you struggle with chronic anxiety, and you've had it for years and years and years, you need more than just this. Uh, And and you need a a care team around you. You need a support team around you. Uh, Because if you have chronic anxiety, uh, you need, you need, first you need a doctor. You need to go and get some tests done, and you may need some meds. That's okay. It's a chemical issue. When people's chemistry is messed up, some people are chronically anxious, like others are chronically angry, or others are chronically depressed. So you need a doctor, and, and, and you need to just go get that. Then second, you need a coach. You, you need a counselor. You need somebody to talk with about it. We have counseling in this church. We do over 300,000 hours of free counseling a year in this church. So you need, you need a doctor. You need a, a coach, a counsel, counselor. And the third thing you need is a support group. And we have, at Saddleback, we have support groups for anxiety and general anxiety. In fact, we got a support group for anything. You got a problem? We got a group for it. And, uh, and, and, and you need at least those three things to make it through. Because if you're having a chemical imbalance in your mind, uh, and for me to just say, well, just trust God, it's like cutting off the wing of a bird and say, well, just fly. And they go, all, 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 saying all you want, fly, fly. If it doesn't have a wing, it's not going to fly. And so you, you might have to get your, your brain stabilized. Now, let me give you one last principle I want to share on this. It's not on your outline, but I want you to write it down. God is a good shepherd who will give you what you need. And here's what I'm going to say. What God gives to me, he wants to give through me. What God gives to me, he wants to give through me. In other words, everything God gives you, he wants you to share with others. The Lord is my shepherd. When he meets your needs, God wants to use you to meet the needs of other people. The fact is, I don't know if you've ever realized this, but God is constantly testing how much you trust him. Every day of your life, your faith, your trust is being tested by God. He's going to see, are you going to trust me? And he does it in many, many ways. By the way, do you know what is the number one way God tests your trust and your faith? Money. Money. Money, finances, why? Because we spend so much of our life trying to earn it, make it, spend it, use it, save it, invest it, whatever. 
And what I've learned is that the more you have, the less likely you are to trust God. Why? Because you start trusting your bank account. And this is a test. It's a test. But when I meet other people's needs with what God has blessed me with, God gets extremely happy because God is a generous God. And he gives nine promises. I'm going to close with a verse you may have never read. It's not on your outline, so write it down. Because I want you to go home and read this verse again. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58, verses 7 to 11. And in this passage, God makes some amazing, astounding promises as our shepherd. And he says, if you'll do these certain things, I'll make sure all of your needs are met. I'm going to read it to you. Okay, it's up here on the screen. Isaiah 58, 7 to 11. Now, he starts off with what he wants you to do. And God says this. I want you to share your food with the hungry. Okay? You're eating well. He says, I want you to share your food with the hungry. Then he says, and I want you to welcome the homeless poor into your homes. Well, that, that, that could even include immigrants. I want you to put clothes on those who need them. Great, got it. And then he says, and I want you to help your relatives who need your help. Oh, come on, God. The first three I can get okay. I don't want to help that crazy uncle. He's such a flake. But God says, I want you to help your relatives who need your help. This is a test. Then he says, if you do these things, and he makes nine promises. These are amazing. Look at this. If you do these things, number one, my favor will shine on you like the morning sun. God smiles on your life, your business, your career. Number two, your wounds, the things where you're hurting, your wounds will be quickly healed because you're helping somebody else. Number three, I will always be with you to save you. All right? Number four, my presence will protect you on every side. I like that. Number five, fifth promise, when you pray, I will answer you. Now, he says, goes back a little more. He says, now, I'll do this if you put an end to oppression. And that would include uh, racial prejudice and bigotry. Put an end to oppression. And if you stop every gesture of contempt of others, including people who are politically different from you. Uh-oh. <laughs> he said, you've got to stop pointing the other side with contempt. If you stop every gesture of contempt of others and you end your vicious talk and pointing fingers on social media. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. Okay. He says, okay, if you stop being such a gripey, complaining person, you stop saying they're nuts, they're dumb, they're stupid, and I don't care who your favorite group is to say that about. He said, if you'll do that, and instead, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and you take care of the needs of the oppressed, then darkness around you will turn into the brightness of noon. He said, your light's going to shine like crazy. And he said, and I, the Lord, will, here's the other promises, always guide you and I will satisfy your needs. That's number eight. And I will keep you strong and well. Hello. Okay. Now, if that's not true, God's a liar, you should go home and never come back to church again. Because I'm not going to worship a God who's a liar. But God has said, if you do these things, I will do these things in your life. Because I am your shepherd. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, you are the source of everything we need to live, and yet we look everywhere else. And there's nothing that we need that you can't supply. And it's really clear in your word that you do not want us to ever, ever worry about anything. You said it repeatedly. You've told us that worry is unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. It blows things out of proportion. You've told us that worry is unnatural. We humans are the only people in the entire universe that worry. Nothing else that you've created worries. Everything else in creation trusts you. 
You told us that worry is unhelpful, that it's not going to add a single hour to our life, not make us taller or shorter, cannot change the past, cannot control the future. You told us that worry is unnecessary, that you have promised to meet our needs if we'll just trust you. And you told us that worry is unbelief, that when we worry, we're actually acting like atheists. We're acting like orphans that don't have a loving Heavenly Father, don't have a shepherd. You said, don't be worried, believe in God and believe in Jesus. So Lord, today, we wanna learn to trust you to meet our needs. And we wanna practice it this week. Now you pray. Say, God, every day I wanna ask you to be my shepherd. And if I have to say it 20 times a day, the Lord is my shepherd. I'll remember that when I worry, you're gonna feed, you're gonna lead, and you're gonna meet my need. Jesus Christ, I want to give you first place in every area of my life. Have access to every room in my home. No drawer, no closet, no room is off limits to you. And whenever I worry, help me to realize that that area is an area that's not under your control. That I've held it back and that I love it more than I love you. God, this week and during this entire series, teach me to relax. And to not hold on to my worries, not to stuff them or repress them, but to confess them. To give you my worries in prayer. To not hold on to them and say, God, here's a worry. I'm worried about this and give it to you. And then Jesus, help me to trust you for one day at a time. To not worry about tomorrow. It'll have enough trouble of its own. But depend on your power today to solve today's problems and your power tomorrow to solve tomorrow's problems. I just want to trust you in every single area. If you've never said it before, say, Jesus Christ, I want you to become the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. And I humbly ask this in your name I pray. Amen.